This episode was sponsored by MPB, the world's largest online platform for used photo and video kit. Visit MPB. Com. Hey folks, in this episode, I'll be speaking with Brett Stanley. We're going to be talking about the diver and the mermaid. This is Twitter. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, I have the distinct honor of talking with Brett Stanley. He's a celebrated underwater photographer who has a pretty cool project that we're going to dive into in this episode. Uh, Brett Stanley, welcome welcome to the podcast, man. How's it going? Good, Frederick. Thank you. Thanks for bringing me in with some uh, some quality puns. Good quality puns is what we're all about. We make those around here. So, <laughs> Well, this is, this is going to be good. We have a ton of stuff to talk about. Um, this project you're working on, your history in underwater photography and how all that got started. You and I, uh, we did our little pre-interview several days ago. We were kind of you know, hashing it out about what we're going to talk about in this interview. Turns out, you know, we didn't really need that pre-interview because we have so much to talk about. But one of the, one of the things that I learned, because I'm, you know, I I am a consumer of underwater photography, not a producer of it. So I'm not right. engaged in that world like you and some other people I know are. But after speaking with you, I spoke with a friend of mine, Craig Stampfley, and some other people, and they were like, yeah, Brett Stanley, we know who that is. You know, you're <laughs> apparently a legend in the underwater space. Care to explain yourself, sir? How did you get there? <laughs> I, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. Like a lot of that is, is news to me, I think, as well. So um, I don't know. I, I've been shooting underwater for, for eight years, I think now. Um, and and uh, the underwater world is such a niche. Like it is such a small community that you kind of end up sort of knowing everybody after a while. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also there's not that much resources out there. Uh, in terms of like YouTube videos and um, being online and, and sort of tutorials and stuff. So when you do a Google search, you know, you kind of end up finding the people that are doing the stuff that you're interested in. So you end up finding the names and, and kind of connecting with people pretty quickly. Um, and the other thing I think is that I, you know, pre pandemic or actually at pandemic, I started doing a podcast myself um, around underwater photography. Um, and I think a lot of that, a lot of people found me through that and just through the interviews that I've done and, and um, with other creatives under the water. And I think people have really kind of um, resonated with, with that sort of community and, and that sort of tribe of people. Love it. All right, so let's 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 dive into just the the set the stage for us, if you were will, on underwater and what it takes to do that. Like I said, I've had a couple of conversations with underwater photographers, and it, they all seem to, or you guys all seem to approach it, you know, a little bit different differently, but with with a lot of aspects that are similar. You know, obviously safety and all those things. How do you approach it? Like for this project that we're going to be talking about today, the diver, the diver and the mermaid. What was this just? you know, let's go out there and see what comes up or were you sitting there for weeks kind of planning things out with a spreadsheet and, you know, a grid paper with, with storyboarding and all that. How did, how did this project or how do you approach projects of this magnitude? Yeah. So, so kind of two parts to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the overall general part of how I approach, um, creating images underwater in the first place is, uh, it's a little bit of a shotgun approach from me. I, I am, good at the overall details you know I'll, I'll plan the overall kind of um concept but the detail sort of stuff i tend to like to leave up until the day because underwater it's it's such a um chaotic kind of experience it's not like we're going into a studio and we know exactly what's going to happen um we know that you know the air quality is going to be a certain you know kind of quality and all this sort of stuff so underwater there's so many random factors that come in that when you actually get to the day you know your whole plan might be out the window because things have changed um <clears throat> so i tend to go in with a pretty open mind um and a, and a rough idea of what i want to get out of it um <clears throat> and i have this kind of thing called chaos theory which is basically me going in letting the universe kind of deliver something to me um, yeah. and me kind of reacting to it rather than trying to control everything um because the water doesn't want to be controlled it, it wants to, it's a force of nature. It, it wants to push things around. It wants to rip things apart. And so you want to kind of just react to what it does. 
Um, and if you're trying to control it and you have this one specific thing in mind, you kind of get really frustrated because the water is kind of actively working against you um, a lot of the time to try and do these things. So, um, so for me, it's very much a bit of a seat of my pants kind of thing on the day of the shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of this shoot though, the diver and the mermaid, it, it, there's so many moving parts in this that we had to have a certain amount of planning in place. So we've got Josh, who is a commercial diver. Um, he works on, you know, um, oil rigs and dams and all this sort of stuff doing, you know, crazy stuff, um, at depth with, with big tools and stuff. And he managed to, um, get in contact with us about this kind of idea that he had, um, of shooting in an old world war ii um dive suit with the full you know brass helmet and all this sort of stuff um so there's that which in itself is a huge it's it's a stunt basically it's not like he's just getting in this stuff every day he you know when we first started he hadn't really even gotten in the suit before um so he had to get this suit and retrofit it and make it work um to be able to us to be able to actually dive in it and have communications and have air and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, and then we've got Hannah Fraser, Hannah mermaid, who's a professional underwater performer. Um, she has, you know, 20 years worth of underwater performance experience. So this is what she does for a living. She's a professional mermaid. Um, and so for that's, her, there's... that's a title. That's a title. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah, cocktail party. Hey, what do you do? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm a professional mermaid. What? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't even know these things existed before I met Hannah about five or six years ago. Um, but this is, she makes her living entirely off um, being a mermaid. It's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is fantastic. And this work, you know, when you say, you know, chaos theory, that yeah i get it you know and a lot of that i think what you're describing is professionalism right because you have to have a a certain degree you have to know your chops right if you're if you're going out to say yosemite you know here in california uh, uh, you know yosemite's not actively trying to bring you know it's not trying to impose entropy on you (laughs) the ocean the ocean wants everything to dissolve and be back to you know whatever it was yosemite not so much so you need to have the wherewithal or the professionalism to be able to be to stay alive underwater you know and combat whatever's coming against you know coming to get you or whatever while also understanding f-stop shutter speed iso composition the goal of the project and all that stuff like me personally i remember early on uh, as a photographer i would the night before a shoot i'd be looking at my camera making sure everything's set up and ready to go and then the day of stage fright right (laughs) yeah he's just like okay i forgot you know i remember this one time i uh someone had told me about this was like years ago they told me yeah you you know you should use try out back button focusing you know this half press stuff is for you know amateurs back button focusing is where it's at and i was like (laughs) yeah that makes a lot of sense and i tried it out the night before i was like yeah this is the way forward forgot all about it on the shoot and my camera wouldn't focus you know like (laughs) why is my camera not focusing restarted everything my brain didn't put it together how do you get past those sorts of things underwater and something as exponentially more complex than a landscape shot you're underwater trying to stay alive and make art how do you do that honestly and it's like you say it's it's kind of knowing your chops it's knowing your skill Um, and knowing how to, to recover from, from something like that, like the back button focus, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a story that I tell, which is, um, the short version of it is we were shooting, uh, me and Hannah were shooting in the Bahamas with a, with a bunch of, um, reef sharks, 20 feet down. Um, you know, the water is all chum. There's sharks all around us. And we kind of got to get down, do this shoot and get out of there. Um, I get down there and, um, I'm trying to focus and my focus isn't working. And I just couldn't work it out. And then it dawns on me that I had taken my lens off and, and cleaned it, put it back on again. And the uh, autofocus button had turned to manual focus. Mm. And so now I'm at the bottom of, you know, on this reef 20 feet down um, and can't focus my camera in any way. So uh, for that, I have to actually, you know, swim myself back up to the boat climb mm. in. And this is the boat where the chum is, where the sharks are kind of smelling all the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, crack open the housing, you know, change that setting and then get back in the water. And meanwhile, you know, 
the number of sharks has doubled and I'm kind of crapping my pants and, you know, all because I forgot to check one little thing. Yeah. So Yeah. A fatal error. Right. So how, yeah. It, yeah. That, that's just so many questions, Brad. So many, <laughs> so many <laughs> yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, yeah, it's, it's almost risk reward, right? At, at that oh, point, if, absolutely. if there's a, a, you know, a crowd of sharks up there, you do, you're making some, you know, these photos that we're looking at here are amazing. Right. But they ain't losing my leg amazing you're right so, exactly yeah, yeah how do you do that calculus uh you know what you know it's it's worth it I, I my chops are at a point where i feel like i can do this and you know those organisms aren't going to eat me right now maybe they're not hungry or whatever how do you do yeah. that calculus that the shot the end result is worse is is worth the potential loss of life the, the, I mean, this is a huge thing for me, and it's a huge thing that I talk about um, when I'm teaching underwater photography and stuff as well, is safety trumps creativity. You know, um, yeah. we can get in these spaces, we're in these amazing places, whether it's in the open water or in the just in the backyard swimming pool, we're creating these images, you know, that no one else on land is getting. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, there's a very high risk that we can die. You know, yeah. we can't breathe underwater. We can only hold our breaths for a certain amount of time. Um, if someone gets caught on something and can't get to the surface, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, and I think a lot of my time is spent um, sort of uh, gaming out all the different scenarios where things can go wrong and either working out a, a way to stop it or just kind of going, well, this is not worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And I have done underwater photo shoots where I've, where I've just had to can it, where I've just gone, look, this is too dangerous. We cannot, you know, what we're going to get out of this is not worth potentially risking someone's life or injury. Um, and as the photographer, as the kind of the leader of, of that kind of um, experience, you have to be the one to kind of say, you know, this is not worth it. Yeah. And, yeah. and you have to, you have to live with that. And, and it's better to live with the loss of a creative image than the loss of someone's life or a limb or anything else yeah. or anything yeah <clears throat> yeah you know it, it's uh, so many questions pop up with this because it's logistics right i mean we could we could do a whole episode on just the logistics and the planning and, and all the safety stuff we're talking about but yeah. at the beginning of an underwater photographer's career i would imagine like if, if i'm if, if i'm watching this and i'm like wow that is amazing i want to do that stuff if you're if you're if you're just quote just you know quote words doing boudoir or something on land something like that it's you know the challenges are different right yeah, but not yeah. not seemingly insurmountable like underwater photography because the yeah. skill sets involved there like you said under just diving you know mm. and having all those and then the gear on top of that to make sure your equipment is safe and all that yeah. Advice to photographers that are like, you know what, I want to try this, but that just looks, you know, I, I don't have a pool in my house. I, do, I can't do that. And where do I find the models that are willing to do this? I don't have a hand. Yeah. You know, how, how, what's your advice to the new guys that are interested in this genre? So I think a good way to think about it is is thinking about it less as a photographer going underwater and and more of, of a sports person taking photos. So if you think about like, you know, rock climbers, you know, there's some amazing rock climbing photographers, um, but they're not photographers who just decided to go climb a rock and take some photos. You know, like they, they learned how to be in that environment. They learned how to, you know, be safe and not fall off a rock and kill themselves. Yeah. Um, so being in the water is the same sort of thing. You need to be confident enough in your abilities underwater. Um, and if you're not that confident, you know, team up with people who are that confident. Um, so, you know, generally you want to have some safety, someone else who's uh, keeping an eye on you or keeping an eye on the talent, um, someone who knows the water enough to be able to get in there and comfortably, you know, pull someone out or assist someone, uh, any of those sorts of things. Um, the other thing as well is a lot of people tend to think when you shoot underwater, you need to go into deep water. Um, and it's just not the case because I shoot a lot of the time at my studio here in Long Beach uh, in my shallow end, which is only three and a half feet deep. Mm -hmm. And um, with a nice wide lens um, and some nice lighting, I can get some amazing images just from being in, you know, waist deep water. Yeah. So, so when you're starting off, just just ease into it. You don't need to do the biggest, most amazing thing to start with, you know, ease yourself into it, get used to the, to the environment. Um, because you don't need to just worry about the talent. You got to worry about yourself as well. Are you safe? Are you going to put yourself in danger? Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, these sorts of things is it's kind of getting creative with the safety as well. Like, like I say, shooting in the shallow end is a creative way to be safe. Mm-hmm. Um, and so long as you're just under the water, you know, you're still going to get these amazing images. I think, you, I think we have the book title for your, for your next instructional book, <laughs> shooting in the shallow end. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> the, sub, the subtitle is uh, a, a newbie's guide to staying alive with underwater photography. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Done. It's all yours. <laughs> the subtitle is when in doubt, just stand up. Just stand up. Yeah. Breathe. Yeah. When in doubt, breathe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned gear. Uh, I don't I want to I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about gear and equipment, but obviously there's yeah. certain gear that you need to put on your camera, the housing to keep it dry and operational. What what is your sort of go to equipment set when you're going down, going underwater? Yeah, so so what I use is a Canon 5D Mark IV uh, with a 16 to 35 millimeter lens, um, and then that is all wrapped up in a in an Aquatica housing. Um, and now this is a metal housing. It's, um, it's deep dive rated. So I can take this down to like a hundred, 150 feet. Um, so it's, it's big, it's metal. It has a large dome on the front of it, um, to give me some good, good clarity in the images and the dome kind of, um, keeps my lens, uh, to the right focal length, yeah. um, due to the magnification of the water. Um, and then I have a series of either, um, above water lights, either strobes, um, or underwater light strobes that actually attach to my housing or I can put them on stands and stuff. Um, and, and a range of kind of other different lighting setups as well. So what I tend to do is I like to shoot in a very sort of cinematic way. So I like to have the lights off my camera to be able to set them out around the, um, the, the, uh, the set and, yep. and kind of shoot things a little bit more to me, a little more interesting in terms of shaping the light and stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It, again, it just seems like okay, <laughs> you know, a fifty millimeter lens and a full frame body. I'm out there going. This is a lot, right? This is this yeah. is. A lot. But like you said in the beginning, y- this effort results in images that you're not going to see. You know, oh, and that yeah. other people can't just walk outside, take a picture of a bee pollinating. You know, and go back in and post it. This takes yeah. serious logistics. Like we were looking at in some of those videos that you have the the documentary video on the website there. There it's expense and effort and man hours and all that that go into these these photos. It's not just a cannon and a housing, an aquatica housing. This is a lot yeah. of stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the rules apply in terms of, you know, the old adage of the best camera is the one you have on you. Yeah. Um, and I think that is my kind of ethos for for shooting. You know, a lot of people jump into photography and they buy the best of everything. Um, you know, the latest lenses, the latest cameras. Um, but they, without kind of realizing that that's not how images are created. Um, you know, you don't, your images don't get particularly better because you've spent more money. Yeah. Um, so what I tend to think of it is, uh, you know, I've shot some amazing stuff on my iPhone five, you know, years ago that has got me lots of, lots of additional work just from, you know, a short video I shot of, you know, with my iPhone in a camera, in a, like a housing, you know? Yep. So, you know, like $200 worth of equipment. Um, so what it really is underwater is kind of the same sort of thing of trying to work out, do I need the biggest and the best? You know, for me, I do a lot of diving shots, so I want to go deep. Um, so I end up having a metal housing, but, uh, also I shoot in a swimming pool and I go no deeper than like nine feet. Um, and with that, you can just use like a, like an Altex housing or a Ewa Marine bag, which is basically just a, you know, a big fancy Ziploc bag for your camera. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's a few hundred dollars worth of, of investment. So, um, yeah, that, to- that seems, that seems dangerous. It seems like putting, putting cheap tires on a multi-million dollar race car. right? <laughs> well, like- kind of, you know, like cheap tires are, are fine. If you know how to drive with cheap tires, you know, there you go. Yeah. Most, most of the things that happen underwater in terms of, of leakages and, 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 um, and sort of gear accidents happen from user error. So mm-hmm. if you haven't sealed your, you know, your housing properly, yeah, you're going to, you're going to wet your camera. Um, and if you don't do the, you know, the checks and all that sort of stuff. So if you don't check your tires are bald, then, you know, when they blow out, you kind of only have yourself to blame. So, That's right. um, 
So I do kind of advocate for these cheaper options because people want to get into underwater photography. They, um, but they don't want to spend, you know, five grand on a housing for a camera that is, you know, also worth five grand, um, not knowing whether they're going to like it or not. So being able to use these cheaper um, alternatives to be able to just go, oh, wow, well, this is really not for me, or I love this, um, is a really good option. It's just a matter of read the instructions properly. Wow. Yeah. So what, what kind of focal lengths are we restricted to with these housings? Are you, are you, is it wide only down there or are there housings that accept longer focal lengths? Yeah, totally. So, so focal length underwater is, is less, uh, there's, there's certain focal lengths we kind of like to stick with just because of the way the water works. Um, so I shoot with a 16 to 35 because I like 16 as a, as my kind of widest, you know, if I'm shooting people, um, as opposed to fish and animals, you know, people tend to distort if you go too wide. Um, so I want to keep them in an, in a relatively, um, natural looking, kind of uh, a focal length and 35 is great for sort of zooming in and doing you know sort of portrait style headshots and stuff um, but what we have underwater is is water we have water we have particles we have crap between the lens and between the person that we're shooting so um, the closer we can get the camera to the person the less crap is between us and the better the quality of the image mm-hmm. um, so we have that sort of playoff in terms of focal length um, yeah. But in terms of the housings, so my housing, um, the Aquatica housing, has a, a, a an extension tube that fits the lens that I'm using. If I use a different lens, I have to use a different uh, extension tube, just because it means that it gets the the dome away from the front of the lens far enough for it to focus on. So you can, in theory, use any focal length you want, as long as you can find an extension tube that's going to fit and. Uh, and, and kind of um, make that work. Uh, conversely, the cheaper housings like the Altex and the Ewa Marine um, don't have that problem because they're plastic. So they kind of stretch and they move in and out and stuff. So mm-hmm. um, they can generally just, if you can fit a lens inside it, it'll work. Yeah. How do you, how do you and again, this is a newbie question, right? Um, or a, a novice question. You, you buy these, we buy these expensive cameras, right? That have amazing resolving power on these, these, these sensors. Um, we put expensive glass in front of them and then we put a housing on that, which introduces another layer of, let's call it diffraction of the, the light rays, right? And then yeah. outside of that are, you know, notwithstanding any filters or anything you put on there, but outside of that is the actual water and the mm-hmm. distance of the water that you're shooting through. Like you said, with a 35, you're gonna get close and do portraits, or, but you could be farther away. But there's the water and then the particulate matter and then the depth. How does all that work together so that you can or am I overthinking it, right? Is it just, okay, meter and shoot? Or do you have to do, like, are the rules different? The inverse square law yeah. changes, I'm imagining, right? Oh, totally, yeah. It's an inverse, uh, well, I mean, it's, you know, you got your exposure triangle, but yeah. now you've got your exposure triangle with a little um, little thing off the side, which is distance yes. um, from <laughs> yeah. the subject. So, yeah, um, yeah it, does, it does kind of do your head in to start with because the further you are away from your subject, the less contrast they have. So the best analogy is, is think about shooting in a, in a nightclub or if you're in a studio and you've got the hazer on, you know, the more haze you blow into that space between you and the subject, you know, the less you'll see them. Yeah. So underwater, we have to take that into account, which is why we tend to shoot with wider focal lengths. So as I said before, we can get closer and kind of, you know, get rid of a lot of that crap. Um, yeah. out of there um, generally like wildlife photographers or kind of sport photographers under the water will shoot really wide you know like they can be on fish eye or eight millimeter lenses um, because they want to get as close to the subject as possible um, for us portrait photographers though it doesn't work as well because you get that distortion as I was kind of saying before um, so there is this kind of trade-off between lighting something well Um, having all that light bounce off all the particle that's in the water and bounce Mm -hmm. back at the camera, which is what we call backscatter. Mm -hmm. Um, And and trying to use aperture and stuff to kind of sharpen things and all that sort of stuff. So there is, it is a bit of a juggling act underwater of the usual kind of triangle of exposure, but then you also have the environmental crap that's in the way as well. Yeah, all the particulate matter in the in the water. Are you able to yeah. Are you able to um, predict that 
you know? I mean, obviously, you know, you're getting in the water. You don't know what the currents are doing or what giant whale just sw- swam by. <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> yeah. Right. But how do you how do you project? Is it just, OK, we're going to deal with what we have as long as, you know, how, how yeah. do you manage that? So the only way you can really manage that is either by owning your own water source, like like I do. I have a tank here at my my house, um, which is my studio, so I can control the water quality. Um, if you're shooting in open water, like the ocean or a lake or something, then you have no chance of controlling that. Yeah. Um, you can kind of predict it a little bit in terms of swell and time of year and all that sort of stuff. So, so when we shot this project out at Catalina here, we 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 knew that in the colder months, that's when the water clarity is better. So we kind of knew that if we shot uh, towards the end of the year, we're going to probably have a better chance of getting the clearer water. Um, But at the same time, you can't see what the water clarity is like until you get in. So even though we found a good spot to shoot in, um, it was in a certain space that the the current was pushing crap in like sand and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, There's other things as well. I mean, you're joking about the whale, but there are, you know, algae and organisms that actually do spawn at certain times of the year and totally ruin the visibility because there's all this kind of, you know, coral spawn or whatever just murking up the water so mm, yummy it, it is yeah it's delicious especially when it's kind of all over you but um God. but a lot of the time you kind of have to just um lean into what happens so with this project you know it wasn't as clear as we wanted it to be um but i really liked the moody kind of nature of it that's they kind of shot it in a way that kind of lent it more into a you know an overcast kind of moody kind of day so yeah. using what's at your disposal and what the things you actually have can kind of work in your in your favor. Yeah. And then that balance between, you know, that that's the actual environment that you're shooting in. But then you know, you're saying, yeah, it's it's the, the water's clearer when it's cooler. And then I look at these pictures of Hannah out there, you know, Hannah, the mermaid, half naked in that cool water. That's cool. For yeah. Clarity. You know, it, so I'm imagining your shooting time underwater is limited. How how long are you under there before you pop up for a break? So we were all on scuba while we were shooting this. So we had so Josh is on scuba, obviously in the um, in the suit, and he's not he hasn't got a regulator in his mouth, but he's on oxygen from the surface. Um, I was down there on scuba. Justin Lutsky, who was shooting out behind the scenes and documentary stuff, is all on scuba. So we're, we're all down there for as long as we need to be. Um, the the other thing is is Hannah, who, as you say, she's half naked in a mermaid tail. Um, the water was like fifty eight degrees or something. So, um, Fahrenheit. So I think that's, you know, like kind of 10 degrees (laughs) Celsius. So it's, it's really up to her. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So we're limited by the amount of time that she has. So we structured the shoot, uh, in a way that she was in there for as least amount of time as, as possible. So we shot all of Josh's, Josh's kind of plates, um, walking across the bottom and all that sort of stuff, getting him into the right spot. And then once we were kind of done with that, we signaled to the surface for Hannah to get in. And, um, so she's in there, you know, 60 degree water. She's on a regulator as well. So she's got a safety diver who's holding onto her, giving her air. Um, I mm-hmm. think we were probably about 20 feet down. Um, and I think she kind of did that for probably 35, 40 minutes. So while she's kind of freezing her ass off, um, and you can see this here, like, you know, she's cold to the bone, but she is such a professional that she's just, you know, she just does her job, bangs it out as hard as she can. And then, then she's out of there and it's like, you know, warm blankets and hot water and, and hot showers and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like an hour to get rid of the shivers. Right. (laughs) Oh, probably the whole rest of the day. I think she was cold. So, and we're on like a, um, we're on a working commercial dive boat, um, like a commercial boat as well. So there's no showers or anything. Um, we'd had, I think we had enough hot water just for her to be able to rinse off and stuff. And that's where that professionalism comes in, because had you come back with no images or out of focus images or incorrectly exposed images, I'm sure Hannah would have had something to say about that after all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. After all that works. Yeah. They were, they were, you'd have the, the mermaid army and Aquaman and everybody coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And that's the uh, other thing, too, is you do have a bit of responsibility. Like, so for me, I feel the pressure, especially if I'm in a, in a place like that where I don't have control of things. Um, it is really just trying to work on the fly and, um, 
and try and get um makes that make something good out of this you know like even yeah. if it's um not what you were after it's trying to make the most of of what's been given yeah yeah and that's that's called life right that's what we do so yeah yeah you know, i'm curious as we as we as we uh, wrap up um curious about the last process last, the last part of this process you know once you you're done you're wrapped you guys you know the crew you've done this group shot everybody goes home everybody's happy then what are you are you doing all the post processing on the images yourself or do you send them out to a, a retouching crew to do it how does all that happen yeah so i do all my own retouching mainly because i really enjoy that part of the process so for me i shoot knowing that there's more work to be done. So mm -hmm. um, as much as I uh, am obsessed by trying to get everything right in camera, you know, I'm, you know, that's the whole reason we go to Catalina and we don't shoot this in a green screen in my pool mm -hmm. um, is because I like the challenge of trying to make these things real. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a, there's a lot of the color correction, especially when we're in the water like this, where there's a lot of the clarity is not the best. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of tweaking and, and fixing and, and things like that, that we have to do, yep. um, just to kind of bring it back to the vision that we had in the first place. So there is quite a lot of, um, post-production just on, on, on these images, especially to try and get as much quality and clarity out of them. Um, yeah, as possible. yeah. Yeah. And, and just, yeah, I, I can't imagine on something like this with all those variables that we talked about, you know, the, whatever detritus is in the water and then, you know, all the stuff that goes into it, then to hand that off to someone else that is not intimate, you know, they may be competent, but they may not be intimate with the project and yeah, I, it'd be difficult to hand that off and then get the results back and not be satisfied with it. In yeah, it is tough too, because it's, it, it's a, an environment that I know really well. I know how light works underwater. I know what I'm expecting things to do. Um, and I think if you're, if I was handing this off to a retoucher who hasn't had that experience, I think it's harder for them to kind of know what's meant to look right. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of why things are looking that way. So, you know, if, if you've got a model that's in the foreground and then someone who's two feet behind them, depending on the quality of the water, they could be tack sharp or they could just be really kind of murky and, um, and blurry. Yeah. So it's, it's trying to, to work out, you know, why has that happened and how do I fix that in post? Love it. Um, I should have, Brett, I should have asked this at the beginning, but bad interviewer, I did not. What the inception of this project, was this, was this a self-assigned project that you just kind of dreamt up and you wanted to execute or was this commissioned by a third party? What was the impetus of this? No, so this, this was kind of personal project. This was, um, so um, over the years I've seen this image, um, which is computer generated and it's of this uh, mermaid coming into this helmet diver and, and he's all en entranced, but she's actually kind of, you know, with a knife cutting his, <laughs> cutting his air cord. <laughs> um, and I've just loved the, the feel of that image and, and I've always wanted to kind of try and replicate it or, or do it in real life. Um, and then, you know, kind of hooking up with Hannah many years ago um, kind of meant that this was a project that was on the back burner a little bit you know it was in my mind um and then we kind of um uh josh um josh myers the commercial diver he kind of reached out to hannah uh, having the same idea he'd seen the same image and he was like you know i'm the diver let's kind of do this um and then he's good friends with justin lutsky who's also a good underwater photographer and a videographer and so the four of us kind of got together um out of the blue really um uh, all having the same kind of goal. So we, we sort of put this together and we're putting, um, you know, it's kind of like a personal work, but it's personal for all of us. Yeah. Um, and it's also the first step of what we want to do is, is a short film around this kind of concept, you know, um, taking these images and kind of fleshing out the story more. So um, later on this year, we're going to be jumping back in the water and, and actually doing a short, short film around this um, whole kind of premise. Oh, really cool. Really cool. I hope you'll come back on and tell us how that went. Once oh, just completed. try and stop me. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so much. I got. I have a page of notes here, but I'm going to save a lot of this to this next interview we're going to do because we're already running over time a little bit. Um, if, if people want to dive in and check, I can't stop with the puns. <laughs> I can't stop with the puns. I love it. Okay. If, if people want to get wet, get themselves wet on this now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but if you want to, no, there's, there's actually a two, seriously a two part question. 
you know, the people that are looking at this and they want to they want to get into this space. What are some resources that they can kind of jump over to to continue it? In other words, where do you hang out online to get inspired and interact with other underwater photographers? Yeah, there's um, so, so there's some really good Facebook groups that are great for um, kind of connecting and throwing some ideas around. Um, I, I have one as well, um, which is kind of like a private group where people can come and kind of ask questions and stuff. Um, so Facebook's really good for those kind of groups. Um, there's some good YouTube stuff. Um, nothing that's kind of really cohesive. This is what I'm saying. Like there's no real kind of solid kind of community base of, of educational stuff. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is, is check out the podcast. The podcast is great um, in terms of hearing how different people approach different things. I, I kind of chat with um, lots of, you know, underwater photographers, cinematographers, stunt people, um, models and mermaids and, and all this sort of stuff. And I think it's a great resource in terms of, uh, learning things whilst also learning about the people who have kind of have done this work. Love it. And where, where are, where can people find the podcast? What's the name of it? The podcast is creatively called the underwater podcast. Um, so if they go Occam's to the Razor. underwater pod- yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if they go to the underwater um, it's in, uh, Apple podcasts and Spotify and, and all that sort of stuff. Wherever fine podcasts are found, you'll, you'll find exactly. it. Very cool. Brett Stanley, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate you. This is a, it's been a, a really good conversation. Whenever I have these kind of conversations, I know it's been a good discussion because I get excited. I'm like, okay, I want to go try that right now. <laughs> right? Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I feel like I want to try it. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ready. I, I feel like there's some steps that I would need to take before trying this in, in, to include learning how to dive and operate underwater. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> but the images are the carrot, right? It's like, oh, wow, totally. if you can make those yeah. kind of, then all the stuff before that is completely worth it. Oh, absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. All right, Brett. Well, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate you. Thanks, Frederick. It was awesome. Thanks, man. Yep. Take care. Bye. All right. Hang on. This is Twitter. This episode was sponsored by MPB, the world's largest online platform for used photo and video kit. Visit mpb.com.